Good morning. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Erica Offerdahl, and I'm director of the Transformational Change Initiative. And I am just so delighted to welcome you today to our, what is now becoming a biannual event, um, Elevate. And this is just an opportunity for our community to come together and focus on how to engage learners, enhance voices, and advance teaching excellence across WSU system-wide. Um, President's Day is a day off for our students. Um, and usually a big day where we as instructional faculty and graduate teaching assistants get to take a breather and catch up on all that has been happening in our teaching lives. So I really understand what a sacrifice it was for you to, to come here on a catch up day. And I'm just absolutely um, in awe of your commitment to our students here. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to welcome Provost Chilton who is going to officially uh, welcome you all to Elevate. So um, Dr. Elizabeth Chilton is our Vice Provost and Executive Vice President, and I invite you to, to welcome our guests. Well, hello everyone and good morning and thank you, Erica. Um, first of all, I, I just wanna echo what Erica said, which is thank you all for being here and showing your commitment to inclusive teaching, a topic that's near and dear to my own heart and critical to the success of our students. Um, I want to officially recognize Erica Offerdahl and the Transformational Change Initiative team for their efforts, not only on, on the Elevate Conference, but also for their ongoing support of all of our faculty and instructional staff. Following the pandemic, I know many of us felt that we had to suddenly turn back on a switch and be more present and be more engaged, even with our COVID-drained batteries. And I'm thankful to have TCI events like this to help all of us think about the new te techniques and, and support mechanisms we have and think about what we learned from the experience of the past three years um, and, and think about how to apply it moving forward in this ever-changing landscape of teaching and learning. The morning session today will showcase the results of the TCI Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Access, or IDEA grants. Uh, we're full of acronyms today because we have Erica at the helm on that. Um, and we're proud of these collaborations between faculty and staff to build capacity for equity at WSU. As a friendly reminder, applications for the next round of IDEA grants is now opened, and I'm excited to see what the new set of awards will bring. Later this afternoon, the session will focus on you. We know that many of you are feeling overwhelmed as we um, serve as our, really you all serve as our first responders to students in distress. Um, and as they struggle to move forward um, in, in this new world, um, you know, as the son to a college student, when the pandemic hit during his freshman year, I've seen up close and personal the impact that this has on young people as they're trying to find their way in their lives. And I just appreciate all of the support that you all give to them each and every day. So this afternoon session will really provide additional information around the support services that are available to students. Uh, and remember that you're not alone in supporting students' well-being. We have a community of resources and experts who are ready and willing to step in and support you. So um, I know the, the most powerful thing you can do is just know where to send students if you feel yourself you cannot address whatever that immediate concern is. So again, I want to thank you for your ongoing support and commitment to WSU, your commitment to your peers, and most of all, to our students. So thanks again, and Erica, I'll turn it back to you. I committed the cardinal sin of, of Zoom. I spoke when I was muted. Um, thank you, Provost Chilton. Um, I, I do wanna just make a comment about what was going to be our featured workshop for uh, the middle of the day, which was um, we'd invited Dr. Rebecca Pope Rourke to come. She has a really insightful book called um, Unravel Unraveled, and it's about unraveling faculty burnout. And we had asked her to join us 
specifically to attend to um, burnout for instructors, what, what that looks like for us and, and how we can handle it. And I, I felt horrible um, when I received her email late last week indicating she'd had a death in the family, very, someone very close to her and would be unable to give that workshop today. Um, but we will work with her and offer that workshop at a, at a future date. I have received so many emails from our in our faculty just indicating how much they were looking forward to that session and really working alongside their colleagues to attend to this this issue that that is is really salient for many of us. So please keep watching your email and WSU Insider um, for more information. If you are a registrant today, you'll automatically get that email when we get it rescheduled, but then be sure to spread the word and tell your colleagues. I am super excited about actually this first session. Um, last year, when I stepped in as director of the Transformational Change Initiative, I was told about this, um, the IDEA grant. So this is one that I didn't actually create the acronym for. <laughs> um, but the, uh, this was, um, I, I inherited the directorship of the TCI and they had already envisioned this, um, this funding mechanism to really build capacity for IDEA at WSU. And so we were able to award four collaborative projects. And um, today you're going to hear about what they did, um, the lessons learned, and really hopefully plug into ideas for yourself if you want to do engage in this work at WSU. Our first set of um, collaborators, the PIs on, on our first grant that we'll hear about were Caitlin Bletcher, who's on the Vancouver campus, and Anna Whitehall, who's here on the Pullman campus. And they submitted a program where they wanted to have a DEI retreat for HD 205. And so I'm excited to hear how that how they structured that and what the outcomes were. I believe Anna is going to be speaking for us today. So I will turn it over to Anna. I'm looking for her. I know she was here. I hope she's yeah, still I'm right here. Okay, good. <laughs> I should pin you. Um, but Anna, go ahead and, and share with us. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna give a short warning before I jump in today that my computer often likes to glitch out when I have video and audio and sharing a presentation. So if I disappear, it's simply because I'm trying to keep the presentation running <laughs> by turning off my video. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and hopefully this will all work. All right, hopefully you can see my presentation now. I see Shelly giving me a thumbs up. Thanks, Shelly. <laughs> and Erica too, thank you. All right, well, I'm really excited to be here this morning to tell you a little bit about what we accomplished and what we're hoping to still accomplish. We really envisioned this opportunity as the kickstart of something that's going to take much more time than we had in a weekend retreat, uh, but really to start getting us moving forward in a direction of incorporating more idea into this, this class HD 205. So as you can see here, um, and as Erica already indicated, uh, Dr. Caitlin Bletcher and I were the people who kind of came up, she really came up with the idea of this grant and then uh, we executed it together. So this uh, project we're calling HD 205 UCORE High Impact Retreat. And I'll tell you a little bit about why we chose those words for this particular title here in a moment. So let me get my slides to change. There we go. So a little summary of the project before I jump in to kind of the details of what we were able to do. The overall objective of this project or of this using this grant was to increase uh, all the HD 205 faculty's excellence in teaching and accountability to diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is a course that really focuses on um, communication and life skills as the name in, in uh, infers there. It's She did give us fair warning. 
So we'll just wait a second for. Let's give Anna a second. I think she's logged off to log back on. I always like to think that we wouldn't have technical difficulties if we were in person, but you know darn well we would. It would be something different. <laughs> I see a lot of nodding. <laughs> Definitely a way to build suspense. There she is. She's coming on. Okay, I'm going to leave my video off and hope that, that will make us a little bit better. <laughs> See if that happens. No I worries, Anna. You built a lot of suspense. Oh, no, and I told you it was going to happen, and here it is. It happened. <laughs> All right, let's try this again. Erica, can you give me an idea of what you last heard me say? Yeah, we we lost you when you said the name, the name reference. There, you were you were describing. Um, I think that's what Don had in the in the chat was you sort of left off at the name reference there statement. Okay, awesome, thank you. So, in this class, uh, in fact, where we teach effective communication and life skills, we really use an experiential learning model. So we're really working on having our students engage in activities and then reflect on those experiences to enhance their learning. And this photo on the slide in front of you, you can see there's a group of students in class working on an activity around learning how to do consensus. And so this is just an example of what we do in that class. We also focus highly on social and emotional learning in this class. And so a lot of what we're having our students do is think about how their own experiences impact how they might show up in communication, in relationship, in their future jobs. So we saw this as a really great opportunity to incorporate more work on diversity, inclusion, equity, those types of things. And also we know from previous research in this particular class that our students are leaving uh, this class with higher levels of well-being than they entered into the class with and with more leadership skills than they entered the class with. And so we saw this as a really good opportunity to continue to enhance those skills. Additionally, it is a UCOR class that is offered on four different campuses. It's offered on Global, Holman, um, has been offered on Tri-Cities and um, in Vancouver. And we're working on maybe hopefully getting a version of it offered in Spokane. So we're working on enhancing uh, where we also offer this class. And it impacts over a thousand students per year. So we're working, having a fairly large impact on students as well. So we saw this as a perfect opportunity to enhance the, the learning of the faculty, but also the learning of the students through working with that many students in, in a given year. So we were able to bring together seven faculty members uh, of the HD205 teaching team. And so here you, on this slide, you can see all of those folks. We were able to bring to, together our global instructor who, who actually lives here in Pullman, um, our Spokane instructor, four of us from Pullman campus, and then our Caitlin from Vancouver campus. So seven faculty were engaged in this process over a course of a couple of months and um, really started to explore this together. So what did we do? That's what I wanna talk about next. So we were able to meet over uh, virtually two times where we were able to get people together via Zoom. And in our first virtual meeting together, 
we really did an introduction to the project, to what our goals and objectives were, and started to do a little bit of some team building. Not everyone on this team had worked together before this opportunity, and so we wanted to get to know one on each other, talk a little bit about what we thought HD 205 was all about, uh, the commonalities across the campuses, but also the differences across the campuses in the teaching of this class, and to explore what we hoped our students got out of the experience of taking this class so that we had that as a foundation for um, how we might make adjustments moving forward. In our second opportunity to meet virtually, we were able to engage in a workshop with Dr. Amber manning Olulet from um, Oklahoma State University. And I'll talk in a moment about what she did with us, but this was an opportunity for us to learn some more information from an expert, from somebody who studies this um, inclusive teaching and how we might incorporate that into our own teaching in 205. So those two things happened virtually um, and those happened before we were able to meet together uh, for an in-person retreat. And at the in-person retreat, we had some book presentations and we also talked about how we might apply everything we've been learning to teaching HD 205. Outside of these engagements where we were together synchronously, we also read books asynchronously on our own time to look at different models, different pedagogical approaches, different ideas of how we might enhance um, inclusion, equity, and diversity in the classroom. So I wanna dive in a little bit more to the workshop that we were able to do and those books that we um, explored for this, these different things. So like I said, we had this workshop with Amber. The name of the workshop was Anti-Racist Approaches to Course Design and Teaching, Centering Critical Inclusive Pedagogy. And in this, re in this um, workshop, we really focused on kind of four outcomes for the workshop. The first one was to create a common understanding of critical inclusive pedagogy, or what is also referred to as CIP. This idea um, asserts that teaching and learning are deeply interrelated, and it maintains that knowledge creation is socially constructed and from the dominant ideologies and voices. So it really asks instructors to consider who and what is included and excluded in their teaching and learning environments through critical reflection of the course content, the materials, the design, and the participation. So we learned about this model or this pedagogy, and we started to kind of pick it apart a little bit and start to talk about how we might apply it to our class to get curious about who and what is included in our materials, who and what is included in our course design and all of those types of things. So it gave us a framework to kind of work forward together. We also, um, we worked to try to understand our own personal bias and unlearn those in our teaching through this workshop and to understand the developmental readiness for anti-racist approaches. We talked a lot about knowing if your students are ready to have these conversations, if your students are ready to learn this material and how you would make that determining factor. And then we considered using CIP in our own teaching and on our own course design. So this was a one hour workshop. That was a lot to cover in one hour, uh, but it really gave us a framework and an opportunity to continue those conversations when we met in, in person in our retreat. So we had that workshop. And then, like I said, we read these, these books. So we focused on three different books. Each book was read by two or three faculty members. So not every, all of the faculty members read all of the books, but everybody was given a copy of all of the books. So they had those for their own reference. They could read them on their own time and we could look at them together collectively. So the first book was, uh, one of the books was called Peace, Reconciliation and Social Justice Leadership in the 21st Century. And this book explores the ways in which leaders and followers can bring forth pacifism, peace building, nonviolence, forgiveness, and social cooperation. And this book, this book really focused on kind of um, real world applications and examples of how this has worked. And so we were able to kind of see how we might use those as case studies or how we might use what was learned from those real world examples in our own teaching. 
The next two books actually are related to each other and uh, by the same author. And so it was really fun to see these two kind of side by side. The first one is operation, operationalizing culturally, culturally relevant leadership learnings, that purple kind of looking one there. And this introduced a model of culturally relevant leadership and gave practical resources designed to raise educators' understanding of the cultural really relevant pedagogy for the purpose of creating inclusive learning spaces that are socially just for students. So this introduced a model and gave a lot of information about how you might go about doing that. And then the second kind of book that builds on that one is the Shifting the Mindset book. And this book gave kind of examples of people using culturally relevant model and how they incorporated that into their own teaching and into their own classrooms. And this book really intends to shift the mindset of the educator um, toward forward thinking and holistic solutions and empowering students to build a fairer and more equitable world for themselves and for others. So this was our foundation or kind of our starting point and got us ready to be in the room together when we got together for our retreat. So we were brought everyone together here on the Pullman campus in, Feb in October. So we were together from October 7th to October 9th. And we spent a lot of our time together exploring those books. Um, so what happened was the two or three faculty members that read each book then came to the retreat prepared to kind of give a presentation, if you will. And this was more than just like a book report. This was thinking about the summary of the book. So kind of giving the idea of what the book was, what highlights of it from a personal perspective. So what intrigued us individually, what we learned from reading that book. And then we asked each person to design an experiential activity where they, we as the people, as the instructors got to engage in a process that we might invite our students to engage in, that we might be able to use in the classroom. This picture on the side of the um, presentation here is a picture of the art museum, of course, but more importantly, it's a picture of a tree and that cinder block kind of thing in the middle, which is actually where we did some of our experiential work. We were able to engage in this um, activity from, that came from one of the books called My Story. And it came from um, a philosophy called Mbutu philosophy that is often used in many African cultures that really cycles around or this idea of I am because you are. And it's about understanding the humanness of somebody else and that we can connect on the level of humanness and how we might go about doing that. And so we engaged in an activity where each of us got the opportunity to share something about ourselves that our fellow instructors may not know about us that really kind of unearthed or started to look at what are we bringing, um, maybe biases we're bringing or experiences we're bringing into our teaching that may influence or impact how we're approaching this work. And so how, that process of starting to maybe unlearn some of the things that we have learned in our lifetimes to be better able to approach our students and our teaching from an inclusive pedagogy framework. So, we did these activities, we engaged in learning about these different books, and then we talked a lot about what we could see being implemented into the classroom and how we might use the frameworks or the models to incorporate into our assignments, into our course design, into our syllabus, into any aspect of the class. Uh, how it would be implemented. And that was really a conversation about considering the differences in the campuses, so how things are done in Pullman might be very different than how they're done in Vancouver or on global campus. And so how we can maintain some consistency across that for everyone, but also uh, take into consideration those differences. And then everybody walked out of the room with a one page kind of highlights or summary of the, each of those books that the presenters had put together. Um, with the key application for HD 205, ideas about how somebody might go about implementing something, um, those kinds of things. 
So we left this retreat in October. And like I said, we saw this as the kicking off point, kind of the starting point of how we might actually adjust and make some of these shifts in our teaching. And we're still in that process. We're still having those conversations. I think it will be ongoing for a long time for us to be having those conversations. Um, but what we really learned from this experience together and then what we're planning on doing moving forward. So what we learned was really the value of having in-person collaboration, uh, getting everyone together who teaches HD 205. We acknowledge that there's a lot of UCOR classes on campus who are taught by a variety of faculty um, and that they don't always get the benefit of collaboration with one another. And we thought this was really important for the content of our class, for the way that we teach our class and for ensuring that we were on the same page about how we're going to be moving forward and incorporating this into our work. And through that in-person collaboration, we were able to unearth that there is some differences in power and access to knowledge for our faculty on our team, uh, based on what campus they're on, based on what they're affiliated with on those campuses, based on access just purely, you know, our global instructor just does not have as much access as the rest of us do. And so by having these frameworks of DEI and idea to look at our work through, we actually were able to unearth some structural or kind of uh, procedural things that were happening on our team that were not equitable, <laughs> that were not inclusive. And so that was kind of an unexpected product of this that we didn't really think what we were going to get out of it, but we thought was very important conversation to have and to be aware of how do we change that for ourselves as a teaching team, even moving forward. And then we also really Got, thought it was really important to have this importance of the expert wisdom, whether that was through the workshop with Amber or through the different reading that we all now have shared in common. We have a common language, we have a common framework and a common perspective to look at our work through that we didn't have before this time together. And so that expert wisdom really framed our retreat conversations and the language and the lens that we looked at it through that if we had not had done that pre-work, that retreat would not have been quite as fruitful. And then we also gained a lot of knowledge about potential pedagogical models that we can use for our class. We wouldn't have known, necessarily known about these models had we not engaged in this work that we can now apply to how we're building materials moving forward. So one of the, some of the things we're gonna do moving forward is we're gonna be committed to having more consistent collaboration and communication across all instructors, ensuring that you know, those four of us who are in Pullman, we talk very regularly. Our offices are literally in the corner of a building. We're together almost every single day. Uh, but our global instructor in Vancouver and Spokane, they're not with us. And so how do we bring them into the conversation more intentionally and ensure that when we're seeing things work or not work in our implementation, that we're sharing that together. So we also have created a OneDrive folder to share resources so that anybody on the teaching team can put things in there, an activity, an assignment, a class that they have done that we can share that with each other. And then it's opened up an opportunity for future application and assessment. In fact, Caitlin and I are hoping to do some assessment work around some activities and present at a conference in the future about that. So we're able to spread even beyond WSU and beyond our students about some of the work that we're doing in implementing these different models or, or pedagogical approaches in our own teaching. So that's kind of where we're headed. And, and you know, like I said, this is still a work in progress. <laughs> we're still doing the work today. Um, and we have, a, I think, a long ways to go, but this was a really great opportunity for us to kickstart that work in a way we maybe wouldn't have without the funding. So thank you for letting me present today. We definitely have time for maybe one or two questions for Anna and her team. <laughs> I have one about your unanticipated outcome. Mm -hmm. um, I just find that 
fascinating, number one, and number two, how powerful for you to uncover um, some of the inequities that you had within your team. Um, can you can you talk about differences in access? You said, like, for example, the global faculty member. Can you just talk a little bit more about the inequities that you saw? Yeah, sure. So, you know, a, a lot of the materials and things that we have used in HD205 are based on other frameworks or other models that some of us have gotten some pretty intensive training on. Um, and for example, our global instructor has not. So most of us have gone to a four day kind of intensive retreat to learn this material well, to be able to teach it and embody it in the classroom. And she has not had the opportunity to do that. Um, so that's one example. I also think, you know, it's just access to even things like when we create a new assignment, we haven't been really intentional of sharing that with her, you know, and being like, well, we tried this and here's an opportunity we think would be cool for you or um, just even small tweaks that we're making to the class that are not being translated into other, uh, onto other campuses. And that's purely out of lack of intentionality, I think. Um, so yeah, access to resources as far as just like even assignments, but also professional development and things like that. Wow. Yeah, I could see where that would where that would happen, especially when you have you could, you all really are right there next to one yeah. another. So, <laughs> and you're busy and you have this chance for an informal conversation. So that intentionality. Wow, that's really powerful. Um, thank you to Anna and her team for sharing with us. Um, you, our, yeah, I, you guys are going to just this is so cool. We have all the projects are so um, complementary yet different. So I think you'll find them really exciting. Our next um, speaker will be Samantha Solomon, and um, it was she and Karen Weatherman put, were awarded um, a, a grant to focus on common reading. Um, specifically, the title of their project was Idea Driven Common Reading, Developing a Teaching Guide that Promotes Access to the WSU Common Reading Text. So I'm going to um, hand it over to Samantha. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> okay, great. Let me go ahead and share my presentation with you guys. I think I'm a little rusty at Zoom, so please forgive me if I do this wrong. Okay, <laughs> can everyone see that okay? <laughs> All right, awesome. Um, so thank you so much, Erica, for that introduction. Um, Samantha, you might wanna um, go up to your display settings there and click switch. Swap, Swap presenter. presenter view and slideshow. Gotcha. Better? Okay. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, I like I said, a little rusty. <laughs> we, we all uh, are. <laughs> yep. Now that we're back in person and all that. Um, yeah, so the name of our um, project was Idea Driven Common Reading. And uh, really the idea here was to develop a teaching guide um, driven by kind of the concepts of inclusion, diversity, equity, and access, of course. Uh, to be used as a companion with anybody using the common reading. So that was to include, you know, um, faculty members using the common reading text, which this year, of course, I think you all probably know is Robin Wall Kimmerer's Breeding Sweetgrass. Um, so any faculty member using that in a class, also any staff or anyone else on campus using it to host any kind of programming connected with the common reading and its themes. <clears throat> So today I want to talk about um, obviously the overall goals of our project, what our team did, uh, the process we went through. I'm going to highlight some of the key products that we came up with as well as the results, um, some of the things we want to do moving forward with kind of continuing on this project, and also how you all can participate in some of the outcomes of this project. Um, so the first thing I want to highlight are some of the overall goals, and my team and I met a lot <laughs> about this project over the summer, last summer, so 2022. Um, and again, we really wanted to have the overall goal of creating a teaching guide that could be used alongside the common reading text for the academic year of 2022-23. At the time that we submitted our application for the grant, we actually did not have a text chosen yet. Um, but very quickly during the process of you know, hearing back about that grant application, um, we did hear that the text chosen was braiding sweetgrass. So we were very excited um, to get started and sort of hit the ground running with that. 
Um, so the the teaching guide was again to be designed for faculty and staff who use the common reading text in classes or who host any events, as well as for the general public. That was really important to us. Um, I'll probably mention this later, but one of the really appealing things about Bring Sweetgrass is that it's free for anyone to access um, on WSU campus. So students, faculty, staff, anybody wanting to use it. So we wanted to make sure that our teaching guide was just as easily accessible. Um, the guide itself is specific to this year's text, but we were very keen on making it a template to build upon in future years. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Of course, our main overall go goal was to have the teaching guide center around a focus on uh, the tenets of IDEA. Um, and we did that by providing teaching resources that highlighted the text's existing themes of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, so if you've ever used any of the common reading books at WSU, then you probably know that these themes often come to the forefront already. That's sort of one of the things that goes into the, the decision making about the common reading text for the year. But we wanted to make sure that the teaching guide itself really brought those to the forefront and made sure that the resources we included in there, the activity ideas, really highlighted the existing themes of DEI um, in, in the text. So we created teaching resources that encourage the use of equity minded pedagogies and created a guide that, uh, of course, is easily usable and accessible to all. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The guide itself is comprised of a couple of different main sections, which I will show you in a minute. Uh, one of the things that was really important to us was developing a comprehensive list of primary and secondary sources to be used alongside the text. We went into this with the assumption that anybody accessing the guide was either thinking about using braiding sweetgrass in their teaching environment in some way or that they were already doing so. So we wanted to make sure that there was something there for everybody where if they were using the common reading text at all, that they had a ready to go list of resources that they could use to teach alongside the text in their uh, classrooms. So we did uh, incorporate cross-disciplinary perspectives and we relied on the expertise of our team to make sure that the text was usable in those various teaching environments. Um, we included sample classroom activities and assignments to be used in those various teaching environments, again, in the classroom, but also alongside any sort of event that maybe staff or faculty were planning. And we also directed users to outside resources that complemented the text themes of DEI, uh, and you'll see what that looks like in a few moments. And finally, our final common reading, our final project goal was to uh, enhance and further the goals and mission of the existing uh, common reading program by addressing the gaps in existing programming. So we have a very, very robust common reading program. Uh, as I'm sure you all know. And one of the things that we thought was that this teaching guide would be a really critical missing piece to provide another entry point into the common readings use sort of on the ground level in the classroom. Um, and that would sort of supplement the existing programming that we already have going on. It would also further support those already using the text, increase its use by making it easier to incorporate, and of course, include by by extension uh, more student interaction with the common reading text in in more various envir environments. So our team was comprised of Julian Ankney, Corey Johnson, myself, Karen Weatherman, and Kara Whitman, who's here presenting her own work today. <laughs> um, and I'll talk a little bit for a moment about how we formed this team. Uh, Karen and I both work in first year programs. Uh, we early on realized that some of the resources that Corey Johnson already creates for the common reading, um, specifically the library resource guide, would be an amazing companion to this project because a lot of those resources seem to naturally fit with the goals of our project. Kara was incredibly helpful because she has sort of that environmental lens to lend to it. Um, and we really needed that to come to the forefront in some of our teaching activities. And then, of course, Julian Ankney, who is a lecturer in English and also recently became the um, director of Native American programs over at the Vancouver campus, was really helpful in kind of helping us make sure that a lot of those resources that you'll see on the teaching guide that are Indigenous focused were relevant, lined up really well with kind of some of the activities we were doing and so on. 
the process of our project involved a lot of collaboration over the last summer. We assembled the team, as I mentioned, based on the, our own kind of expertise on different subjects and divided the work based off of the knowledge of the topics and our experience with the resources we were putting into the teaching guide. We collaborated a lot with each other uh, in frequent collaborative meetings where we sort of just worked on the guide itself, but we also all sort of divided up and found other resources that could be incorporated into the project. Um, the collaborators then submitted the content to me and I was responsible for sort of creating the actual final product, putting it all together in, in a comprehensive guide and really focusing on the usability of the product itself. Um, for dissemination, we wanted to get this guide out to as many people as possible. So we were obviously the primary idea was to post this on the common reading website in PDF form, ensuring that anyone could download it. But of course, we needed to make sure people knew to go there. Uh, so we sent it out to a ton of listservs. We used um, WSU media sources like WSU News and The Insider to publicize it and really just kind of kept pitching it and saying, hey, if you're using the common reading text in any way this coming academic year, um, or if you're even thinking about whether or not it would be a good fit for your class, uh, check out this guide and it should have everything you need to make that determination. So without further ado, I think I should just show you the guide. The nature of this project is very visual. It's going to make a lot more sense when you see it. Um, I really want to highlight, of course, the accessibility and usability of the guide itself. It's focused on the themes of diversity, equity, inclusion, and a broader way, uh, the way we included a broad array of teaching resources for various environments. Okay, so I might need a second to make sure that I'm sharing the correct screen so bear with me <laughs> okay where are you here we go <clears throat> excuse me so when you follow the link for the teaching guide you're going to see that it brings you to the common reading website where it's pretty clearly publicized um all you have to do is click on the link and it opens the guide right away which is pretty neat um so i want to highlight some of the key elements of the guide just to make sure that it's clear kind of what the idea was behind the actual design of it. Did I accidentally, hold on a second. Yes, okay. Um, so the first thing that was really important, probably more important to me, <laughs> uh, was that I really wanted it to be usable in the sense of it being hyperlinked to all the different content of the guide. So you can see right away uh, when you enter into the guide through the table of contents that you could look at the guide and determine what is relevant to you and get there immediately. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to encourage was that if somebody was teaching a specific type of class, we didn't want them to have to scroll through the entire guide to see all of the different you know, classroom activities or the resources that may not necessarily be relevant to the type of class they're teaching. So having this hyperlinked, easily usable table of contents allows them to see, okay, well, this applies to my classroom situation and it brings them right to there in the guide. A couple of highlights about what's included in the guide itself. We start off with a message from Karen um, and what she does here is essentially explain the purpose of a common reading and really drives home why we use a common reading, what the opportunity of using a common reading is, and also gives a bit of an introduction to this year's common reading text. We then move into um, some resources on helping students uh, establish a sense of self and purpose and understand their community, both of which are huge themes in this year's common reading text, as well as some classroom discussion techniques. Uh, this is the part that is really fun uh, for me. <laughs> we bring in how to use the common reading based on the different WSU learning goals in UCOR. And this took a lot of discussion and back and forth and kind of decision making on our parts. We knew we wanted to have ready to go activities, classroom discussion ideas and resources, but we weren't quite sure for quite a while how to do that. And eventually we settled on dividing the sections by UCOR and I'll show you what that looks like. So when you enter into the guide, it brings you to a specific section of UCOR, and then it has these tables that have ready to go class activities, campus resources, 
and how to use the common reading text specifically. So how we would use braiding sweetgrass to teach this specific thing. And the reason we did it this way is because, again, we wanted everyone to immediately see what was relevant to them in the guide if they were teaching a certain type of class and were trying to imagine how they would incorporate the text into class. So we've divided it based on the UCOR um, in order to get, get a starting point of, you know, hey, what type of UCOR class am I teaching? And then it brings you to the type of um, skill that you're teaching in that class and so on. So that was really cool. The last bit of the guide that we have here is a whole lot of resources. So we've divided the external supplementary re resources into campus and community resources, uh, subdivided, of course, by WSU resources, indigenous resources, hallucinative ecology resources, and movies on indigenous subjects. Again, all of these were designed to go hand in hand with this year's common reading text, but in the future, these will all be specific to whatever common reading text we have uh, during that academic year. So we have the campus and community resources. We've also highlighted exhibition resources and collection from the Museum of Art on campus. Uh, resources from the MASC and the CDSC, as well as that library guide that I mentioned earlier. Um, this is an existing document that Corey Johnson um, makes for whatever the common reading is every year, but we decided to embed it into the teaching guide itself so that it was ready to use for anybody using the guide as well. The last thing in our guide is the braiding sweetgrass list of topics. Again, this is something that will change each year. Uh, this is also Corey's handiwork. Um, Essentially, what he does here is he lists every section of the book and every chapter and gives a list of topics, themes. Uh, it serves not only as a summary of what each section is about for instructors to use to kind of jog their memory about what each chapter is, see what might fit for their specific classes, um, but it also has lots of definitions, all the kinds of things you might need if you are teaching specific sections of the text. So that is what the guide looks like. Um, moving forward and the building capacity that we have for the work that we started with this year's um, first teaching guide is that we built this foundation. Um, this first incarnation of the teaching guide is really going to serve as a template and also sort of a trial run of what we want to do in the future. The main idea here is that each year we will have a teaching guide to have readily available for faculty, staff, whoever, to use alongside the common reading. And of course, that will change in both form and content. But we also wanted to make sure, especially since the common reading often has very specific themes that align with DEI in the book, that we were being really specific about what those were in this year's common reading. So, of course, with Braiding Sweetgrass, we had a lot about, um, you know, the indigenous resources that you saw in the guide and activities that really brought those things to the forefront. Um, also, themes of community and connection. Um, and, of course, the huge puzzle piece of environmental sustainability and things like that. So all of those things will be sort of customized in the future. Uh, we now have that template that can serve as that source of customization, and we've also developed a ready-to-go set of resources. Many of the resources on the guide will be relevant to many common reading texts in the future, but some of them may, you know, may change. They may need to be more specific. In the future, we are going to make sure that the teaching guide continues to be informed by the mission of Advancing IDEA. Um, specifically, we want to ensure that we are highlighting those issues of local and global importance uh, in the common reading itself by providing activities that address the needs of diverse students and invite students to bring to the forefront their own various ideas and perspectives, as well as resources that can supplement discussion of the text through that lens of inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. Finally, one of the things that's really interesting this coming year, being that we just finished the first common reading teaching guide and we're looking forward, is that for the first time ever, we're actually keeping braiding sweetgrass for a second year. This is the first time, Karen, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe this is the first time that uh, at WSU we are using a common reading text more than one year in a row. And there are several reasons for that that I wanted to pitch. 
because this is going to impact the the time that we have to continue building on what we've already done for this project. Um, this will first and foremost allow us to shift the timeline of our selection process for the common reading text. I think it happens about six months earlier now than it used to in the past. That gives us a lot more time to meet with the common reading committee, go over text selection and pr plan programming. Um, keeping Braiding Sweetgrass for another year also allows us to align with several exciting on-campus activities happening next year, including Indigenous artist Jeffrey Gibson being in residence at the WSU Museum of Art all next year, um, allows us to have some interaction with the curated exhibits on Braiding Sweetgrass at the Museums of Art and Anthropology. There's also a set of cluster hires coming in to WSU next year across different fields and campuses um, that focus on indigenous perspectives and themes. And so of course, Braiding Sweetgrass is perfect for that. Um, and the Foley Institute next year is focusing on climate and environment, which of course aligns also with this year's common reading. Uh, this will also allow us to continue using the common reading book that is free. So that's a really huge appeal for Braiding Sweetgrass. And it will help us continue building on the teaching guide with feedback and suggestions from you all. We really view this document as a living document, and we want to be able to incorporate any feedback of any user or anybody who sort of goes into the guide and sees what could be better. So we encourage continued contributions and feedback. Um, we are also looking to add new resources for those campus specific events happening in the next academic year that we talked about, making sure that the guide itself pushes people out to those events and also provides supplemental resources for them. And finally, Myself thinking about uh, potential increased usability and access, one of the early ideas that we had that we talked about that didn't quite fit into this academic year was taking the contents of the teaching guide and translating it into maybe a canvas space that instructors can opt into so that the resources and the teaching activities and everything that we have in there could be easily uh, copied over to everybody's own course space if they choose to do that if they're using the text. We didn't quite get to do that this year, so the fact that Braiding Sweetgrass is, hap you know, is the common reading text for another year gives us more opportunity maybe this summer to explore that option and see if, you know, if that's a good idea to move forward. So two ways you all can participate in the ongoing work of this project, obviously using the resources in the teaching guide to support your use of the common reading text in any way. So even if you teach your students one chapter or just mention it or encourage them to go to common reading events, uh, there are resources in the guide for you. You could also help us by providing feedback and resources to be included in the current guide in future guides, especially if you notice any gaps in inclusion, diversity, equity, and access, or that would help make the guide more usable and accessible to you and your students by extension. So thank you guys very much for letting me present today. I want to end with a tiny pitch, a uh, shameless pitch, that tomorrow is our rescheduled virtual lecture with Robin Wall Kimmerer, the author of Braiding Sweetgrass. That's happening tomorrow at 6 p.m. It goes until 7.30. You could visit the Common Reading website to learn more. We have various watch parties happening around campus um, and lots of opportunity to really interact with her lecture. So thank you guys so much. Such a fabulous resource, and I'm excited that we get to use it for another year. I love this. It really dovetails nicely with all those events that are going on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next um, team that will be presenting is Don McMahon and Wendy Steele. They, um, the title of their project is Including All Cougs with Universal Design for Learning. So Don, I'll let you take it away. And uh, Wendy's not here, but Michelle Eccles is, and she's another member of our Thank team. Thank you. So Thank yeah. you. Awesome. Uh, Wendy had to go to another meeting. So, all right. And All right, everyone, uh, thanks for having us. And again, we're including all Cougs with Universal Design for Learning. I think we're one of two UDL, uh, TCI, D, uh, IDEA projects. There are too many acronyms in my world, sorry. Um, 
presenting here today. And this project, our overall goal was to uh, work towards building a UDL certificate. And ideally, one of the things that we want to accomplish with this is, you know, we've got an incredibly talented faculty and uh, staff and instructors across the university. Um, you know, you might be a leading person in chemistry or a leading person in uh, animal science. Um, but sometimes that doesn't always lead to uh, high student engagement or there are students uh, who we are leaving behind. And Universal Design for Learning is a framework for kind of creating innovative instruction experiences that will hopefully reduce barriers uh, to student learning. And whether that's in a hybrid format or in person, which or online classes, there are lots of ways that we can use Universal Design for Learning to hopefully increase student engagement and reduce some of those barriers. The other big value that we see um, in creating this UDL certificate is um, it helps us build a common vocabulary. Um, even inside the College of Education, uh, I find that my colleagues in science education or in cultural studies will often be talking about very similar concepts, but use strikingly different vocabulary to talk about some of those instructional concepts. So UDL is one of the ways that we might be able to help build a little bit more of a common vocabulary around our different um, instructional um, worlds that we all come from. And just quick background um, on our project team. We started to come together, Michelle, was it almost two years ago now, I think? Yep. And um, I think Michelle and Wendy connected uh, because of their shared interest in Universal Design for Learning. And um, then I got involved and we were looking for, and we kind of came up with this idea before the TCI grants that we wanted to work towards building out a university-wide UDL certificate. And then lucky for us, there was all of a sudden a uh, UDL certificate available. And, um, uh, helped us really to kind of take what was kind of a little side project for a lot of us and get it to where we are today. Um, I teach a graduate course on universal design for learning. Uh, I have a kind of frame all of my instructional research around universal design for learning and using technology to support students with disabilities. Uh, Wendy Steele, who's not here, uh, she's with um, AOI and does uh, the accessible technology work there. Uh, Michelle, I'll let you take it away, but Michelle did a great job of building out a initial uh, UDL certificate at the Vancouver campus for their faculty. It, thanks, Don. That's a great introduction. Um, yes, one of the things I started doing um, a few years ago was teaching a universal design for learning workshop. And I thought, uh, the more I taught that, the more I thought, you know, this should be something available for all of the university. And Don's right, Wendy and I had started working together on this. And I had actually, uh, Don may not remember, but had talked with Don a few years ago about what he does with universal design in his teaching in education. And Wendy and I thought that would be the perfect person so we are really pleased to be able to um, work with uh, the grant that we were given and to work with each other. And uh, a recent member of our team, but she's been incredibly helpful for us, uh, Stephanie Soledad Lopez Contreras. Uh, she's a teaching assistant in the Department of Teaching and Learning. Uh, her work is focused on uh, multi-language learners and, um, and culturally uh, diverse learners in um, education, both in secondary and in higher education, and how uh, UDL can help reduce some barriers there. And uh, she, shameless plug, she took my graduate course in UDL and changed her dissertation topic. So, hey, uh, I was excited about that. Uh, so our goal is to develop a community of practice focused on improving students, oh, sorry, student instruction um, using universal design for learning um, by allowing anyone who wants to take this uh, course, a little UDL certificate through the UDL, uh, through the WSU system that will 
kind of build on to some of our current like training and faculty resources that we have across the university. And we'd like to make it not just available for faculty and instructors, but um, staff, students, graduate students, who might, anyone who might be interested in uh, building this out. The current legal definition of universal design for learning is here. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things uh, as a researcher in the field of universal design for learning, we don't always necessarily, you know, a lot of people say, I'm doing universal design for learning. I added captions. Well, that's a good start. We're not opposed to captions, but it it's it could be just a touch bigger topic than just, you know, adding closed captionings to your videos. It's really a way of like, rethinking some of your initial um, instructional design choices from the beginning to kind of accept that you're going to have a broad diversity of students and um, trying to reduce those barriers from the beginning. And the Higher Education Opportunity Act of 2008 really was the first um, piece of legislation that really defined what that is for us. This is probably familiar to some of you. These are the UDL guidelines. Uh, I'm a giant fan of these, and we kind of use these as uh, kind of a easy way of taking our students through uh, the online certificate that we're taking, uh, that we're building. And one of the, you know, while uh, universal design for learning can be a little bit more complicated than just knowing these nine guidelines and their checkpoints, it's a good starting place. And for someone who may not have a tremendous background in this, they are tangible things that are, I think, very easy uh, to get started with. And we'll give you some examples of that here in a second. Um, obviously, uh, I think UDL is a great strategy for uh, addressing issues of uh, inclusion, diversity, equity, and access in education. Um, it, while it grew out of kind of a K-12 special education world, the one of the fastest growing areas in UDL right now is in higher education. One of the things that we're so thankful for the TCI uh, grant that was able to accomplish for our team was we were all able to block out two days and go to a um, universal design for learning and higher education digital conference. And we got to, it was one of the most complicatedly scheduled conferences I've ever been to because they really also tried to make it universally available to people in Asia North America, South America, Africa, and Europe. So the sessions were spread out over a very interesting period of time, but uh, the philosophy was if you if you can't possibly make it, they've all been recorded for you. And uh, we really enjoyed that, uh, though it was the first time I was still conferencing at nine o'clock at night in a long time. Um, but it was a, a really great experience, and I think uh, that uh, that brought us uh, the first kind of project meeting that we had after that uh, was really great. One of the things that we've been doing is, uh, you know, when we started the project, we were meeting every two weeks. And then uh, in the last kind of four months, we've been meeting every week as we've been making progress on our project. Um, oh, sorry. So let's take a look at what we've been building. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've done pretty regularly is use teams to help us communicate and kind of build out our checklist of goals and uh, a collection of resources. Um, a lot like uh, I think it was Anna Whitehall was talking about earlier, this TCI project kind of opened up the door. And I think one of the hardest things for us as uh, for people who are really passionate about universal design for learning is to not make this certificate the, you know, metaphorical, like drinking from the fire hose experience of we're going to give you everything that we like, just, I mean, we have, uh, there was a whole lot of ideation of like, let's build all, all of our ideas and let's build this collection of resources. And our work really in the last three months has been whittling down and just trying to take this from all of the things we're passionate about to, we want to build competencies and give people opportunities to dive deeper, but not necessarily make someone get a master's degree in universal design for learning, or even something as complicated as a graduate course in universal design for learning. We're aiming for something kind of in the, you know, hopefully eight to 10 weeks, work a lot, work at it along the way. And then over the course of that semester, you'll have uh, multiple opportunities to 
do some UDL implementation projects. And that's really what we're most passionate about. Um, so here's our course space. And as you can see, we've got from the instructor point of view, we still have lots of content that we're whittling down still. We were, we were really passionate about some things that we wanted to include. Uh, but for the student view of things that we've published right now, there's a little introduction on our self-paced course. And then some kind of foundational things about what Universal Design for Learning is and what we hope to accomplish with our UDL certificate. And UDL is broken up into three broad principles, providing multiple means of engagement. You know, if we can get that student engaged in our instructional lessons and having them take the AirPods out of their head and put their phone down and engage in an activity, that's probably a good first step for them, you know, doing well in our course. Providing multiple means of representation, um, you know, in addition to things like closed captioning, for those of us who enjoy closed captioning or um, just being able to present information in a variety of different ways. Uh, I think it's easy to get excited about, let's say, one particular infographic that you think is a great way of providing this piece of information, but that doesn't mean that someone else wouldn't prefer the alternative infographic to that or a video or a podcast explaining that. And helping uh, instructors kind of feel that they have that instructional space to make those instructional decisions and have some opportunities to uh, bring more variety into their instruction, we think is pretty important in this process. And uh, having some good discussions around multiple means of action and expression. This third principle, I think, is the hardest one for us in higher education. It's probably also the hardest one in K-12 education. I don't think anyone's going to be upset about or you know, think it's a bad idea to provide multiple means of engagement and to do a really fun class activity or to provide lots of ways of demonstrating how to solve this particular like chemistry um, equation or complete this particular lab. Providing lots of a variety of ways for people to demonstrate their content learning and valuing them all equally starts to get a little harder sometimes in higher education because we need to keep things fair and having some discussions around, you know, is creating a infographic the same thing as a equal to a two paragraph write up. Allowing people to have some discussions around that and have some like creative uh, exploration of that is a big part of what we want to try to do. Because sometimes when we allow students to do a little bit of a creative demonstration of their content knowledge, we really unlock some really cool learning that they've achieved and uh, can have a lot of different cool products that can, uh, I've seen it help the entire class when I've done that a few times. So uh, highly encourage that. So in each little part of our um, kind of self-paced asynchronous uh, Canvas course, there'll be a little overview of that UDL principle and some examples for what that looks like in terms of what are some instructional strategies because we want to help them think about some like innovative instructional strategies, but also we try to provide some examples of technology tips. We also state fairly clearly over and over again at the introduction of these, these are just designed to be examples. This is not an exhaustive list. Please think of other ideas. We'll include those as well. But uh, what are some ways that you can help build comprehension? Um, you know, there are some fun ways you can bring technology into the classroom and let, you know, students have use Padlet as a back channel to have some conversation and ask questions uh, while you're presenting some of the information they might go, how does this connect to that, to this other topic that we had yesterday or last week? And they could use that back channel and then you could review that back channel conversation uh, to see uh, what resources or what concerns uh, students might be having. Um, helping students stay organized um, with some of the digital resources can go a long way towards building comprehension as well. But I think one of the biggest challenges in Universal Design for Learning implementation is, you know, I don't hear many people arguing against it. The biggest challenge is what does that look like at Tuesday at 1040 when you're about to teach a class? 
you know, yay, I'm doing UDL. It, it's probably more complicated than that. And you're never going to do all of those nine UDL guidelines or all those checkpoints simultaneously for one lesson. That's probably a little bit of a overkill, but you could take something that was, let's say a lesson that was starting to become a little repetitive that you've over been, you know, uh, in our special education uh, online endorsement, I'll just pick on my own program now. Two years ago, nearly every lesson involved a discussion board post on a discussion board and reply to two people. And there's nothing wrong with that necessarily inherently, but it, it gets a little repetitive. And part of our refresh of our program was really focusing a little bit more on universal design for learning and allowing students multiple means of demonstrating their content knowledge. And so um, as we're kind of going through some of these, um, one of the big things that we're trying to emphasize too is that while UDL can maybe seem a little overwhelming at first, in your demonstrations of effect of your UDL implementation, we're really only asking for initially you to take one lesson for each one of those big principles. So kind of think of it as like UDL plus one, do one thing for providing multiple means of representation. Take one of your lessons and provide do a, whatever you've been doing in the past, rethink that assignment a little bit and think of another way that you could add another means of action and expression. You could choose to write the one page write up, or you could do a 12 minute video that isn't like you with your cat crawling behind you. Not that I have anything against cats, but you know, like really do a like an innovative, like screencast video where you're explaining how this, um, pollution is impacting this uh, situation in an ecology class. So, and then, you know, provide one means of, and demonstrate how you're providing multiple means of action and expression, where you're doing something exciting and innovative that will hopefully help them, for example, understand the salience of why, why are we learning this? Which is a pretty important part of like, why you're hopefully in a class is understanding why it's important. And so our implementation projects are, you know, we're not trying to make this an incredibly uh, burdensome or complex process. We want to have them implement, let's say, multiple means of action and expression, and then just really submit to us kind of a two, three paragraph, like reflection of what the original assignment was how you rethought it a little bit, kind of around those universal design for learning guidelines and the changes that you made. And uh, hopefully they enjoyed some, finding some ways of uh, mixing it up for their students and hearing those lessons. Uh, so those are kind of our big things that we're hoping to accomplish with the project. Um, what we believe it will do for the WSU teaching community. Um, well, you know, again, hopefully help us build that kind of shared vocabulary. Um, we're really open to anyone at all taking it, um, trying to open it up as much as possible. Um, I would be happy for staff, students, um, faculty, all to have access to it. And, you know, I think that this has strong connections to some practical strategies that will help connect instructional strategies to technology resources that will help people, you know, improve access around inclusion, diversity, equity, and access at WSU. So um, in terms of lessons learned, I, I saw that we were supposed to talk about lessons learned. Um, we learned lessons for sure. Um, everything takes more time than you plan for. Uh, we we dived really, really deep uh, into both the UDL research in higher education and what we wanted to have in there. Um, it was really deciding what all to include, but I think we're within about two weeks of like being ready to have like a soft launch and like get some feedback from people. Um, the next steps, um, we've got a really great course um, that uh, Michelle or Wendy could easily move into the WSU Canvas system. Um, Wendy's been talking to um, AOI about what are the best options for that. There are a lot of different like topics to, to consider about 
there's like a self-enroll fee or is it something that has to be a recurring fee every year? We're working out those details and I'm excited to have good answers here in the next couple of weeks. But um, one of the things we'll be using with the TCI funds is to help uh, some of those costs. We're hoping that none of them are reoccurring or complicated, but we're uh, working through that and we appreciate all the support that they're giving us. Um, sorry, um, we wanna get, once we have our soft launch ready, we want to get more um, feedback from uh, individuals in the teaching academy and get some um, resources there. And then we'd like to turn over the project to either the teaching academy or another university par partner or use a second round of TCI uh, IDA grants if that's possible to um, have a bigger pilot of it and to hopefully uh, reach out to lots of different uh, university partners and see if we can get some buy-in across different uh, departments that way. So thanks for listening to our project. And uh, I don't know if we have time for questions, but I'm here if you do want to ask questions. Um, Don, can I add please a little something to what uh, you just talked through? Um, one of the things that I have discovered over the years is that faculty begin to understand what universal design for learning is and, and definitely equate it with accessibility, but they have a harder time seeing where the inclusion and the diversity and the equity come in. So one of the things that we decided to do with this um, uh, course is to add specifically some modules on how those things actually work together with universal design for learning. So I think that will also be a really important part. Yeah. Great point, Michelle. That is a really good point. Any any quick questions for this team? Um, Jennifer's got her hand up. Uh, Don, thank you for the presentation and thank you for all of all of your resources. As a faculty in the College of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, we've been having a lot of conversations about universal design and inclusion, and often the the a stumbling block that faculty run into is they just don't quite know how to take that next step. It seems really risky. And um, having communities that can have conversations around this and how you would go about doing it and seeing additional examples could be unbelievably helpful. Um, and I'm particularly talking about the frame from a health sciences education standpoint. So with this, this coursework, what is the, the credit load or time estimation? And then what are you looking at for enrollment? Because so, I, I would love to offer this out to my faculty. Yeah. Um, you know, our what we've kind of been conceptualizing in our head is kind of a probably eight to 10 week, but I think it's probably closer to a 10 week um, progression throughout the course of a semester with you know a couple of hours of reading per week engaged in this activity. Um, it's a non-credit certificate right now. So it's just a you know on your own certificate um, that would, you know, ideally at some point we're kind of interested in seeing if we could tie it into kind of the fledgling like WSU badging that's out there. Um, but I think bad I'm still learning about the WSU badging. Um, so uh, that's been one of our ongoing things. Um, and if anyone has great ideas, Erica, if there's a if there's a great answer, let it, uh, we're really open to tying it into whatever is going to be the best fit for this. Um, kind of our project idea as a team is we're going to build it and then we're going to figure out where it's going to like be the best home. Um, we can manage it ourselves, but we'd also happily um, hand it over or tie it into badging or whatever is going to be the best fit. Uh, so I kind of think that 10, maybe a few additional weeks, if let's say someone has something in their life and they end up doing it over two semesters, I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. But ideally what you do as an instructor, I would say is, or what we envisioned is 
let's say I'm teaching your one of your courses in pharmacy, which I have no idea what the title would be, but pharmacy becoming a good pharmacist or basics of drug interactions, let's say I'm making stuff up now. But um, I'll, you know, maybe my first implementation activity will be about multiple means of representation. And I'll take what was a pretty static, I'm reading the lecture and all of this critical information. There's still going to be that option, but then I'm also going to start to, let's provide some multiple means of representation about how complex some of these factors are and how multiple drug interactions can start to happen with, let's say, a piece of technology that's starting to show a drug interaction tree. That might be more meaningful than, you know, a laundry list of all the potential drug interactions for some, one of your students. And so the laundry list or the list of interactions would be one option. And then the kind of more complex three-dimensional tree of those interactions would be maybe another. Uh, I'm just kind of brainstorming here. But that's kind of our thought process. What I've When I've done this in my graduate courses on universal design for learning, um, my students are, some are focused on elementary special education, some are focused on English language learners and higher education, and they're all in the same class. And, you know, one of my favorite things is creating like the framework of that assignment and then seeing all of the different examples that come in. Uh, one of the assignments they had, they had to use an interactive whiteboard uh, on an iPad where they could just screencast themselves recording and explaining something. And one, um, one of my favorite ones was there wasn't a good Arabic uh, language class for preschoolers uh, that my, uh, one of my students was uh, content with. So she created an entire uh, one about learning all of the sounds in Arabic on her screencast and shared it out with all of uh, the families that were interested in it uh, at their mosque. So I thought that was pretty cool. Sorry, that's probably random, but. <laughs> well, I see that Alex has his hand up, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna ask you to put it in the chat for Dawn. And um, again, thank you for sharing this, the certificate. I can see where it could plug in in lots of places at WSU. So I don't think it's a question of if, it's a question of, of how and when and getting it up there. Um, our final uh, speaker today is Kara Whitman. And she was a part of a team with uh, Joy Egbert, and they are the ones who brought us Teach X this fall. And so I'm going to have her describe that project and, and um, outcomes and, and remind us of all the awesomeness that that was. So Kara, go ahead and take it away. Hi, good morning. Um, like, like Erica said, my name is Kara Whitman. I'm an assistant professor in the School of the Environment and a scholarly career track faculty member and the current chair of the WSU Teaching Academy. And Joy asked me to come in and speak today, but Joy really is the one who spearheaded this project. So I wanna give her props for that. Um, she wrote the TCI grant and it was sort of her brainchild, which I think has turned into something um, that's going to last for a long time. Um, so I'm gonna just start by giving a short overview of the Academy and its goals and sort of how we utilize the TCI IDEA grant. And then I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Amy Heil, who is going to talk about the implementation of UDL. So it's going to tie directly in with the last presentation. There might be a little crossover. Um, sorry for that, but if you have lots of questions, you know, maybe that'll help um, guide that discussion. Um, the Teaching Academy um, is an organization that's dedicated, um, of, of dedicated and innovative teaching faculty at WSU. Um, our purpose or mission is to provide advocacy, expertise, and resources to WC faculty um, so that they can involve students in transformative learning experiences, to promote a university culture that values and rewards excellence and scholarship in teaching. Um, and this includes goals of promoting a university culture that values, supports, and rewards excellence in teaching and scholarship of teaching. Um, this also um, the goal is to drive implementation of academic goals that elevate the quality of educational program processes and outcomes and student achievement, um, support models of teaching and learning that foster deep and lasting understanding by learners and facilitate the creation of mindsets and practices of students and faculty that drives self-motivated lifelong learning. And the reason I tell you these goals is because I think it fits perfectly in line with the TCI IDEA grant. Um, and with this mission and goals in mind, the Teaching Academy had these ideas to develop 
sort of concurrent projects that included uh, a yearly annual Teach X event and a faculty book club that the topics could be conjoined so that there was this dialogue across our campuses um, between faculty getting to know each other, having a dialogue about teaching pedagogy, about teaching excellence, um, and hopefully turn that into implementation um, moving forward. Um, so for the fall, both of these um, initiatives focused on the theory and implementation of universal design, design for learning or UDL. Um, both of these initiatives fostered conversation, reflection, and insight, as well as supported interactions, interactions between WSU campuses, which are two of the main tenants of the TCI IDEA grants. And I think it was very successful in that. I think we definitely have room to make improvements the next go around. Um, so in, uh, well, with that, I would actually like to thank a few people because I, you know, I couldn't have done the work that I did without a lot of people. And of course, Joy Egbert is the one who sort of spearheaded this event. Um, Kate Watts was the one who led the book club along with Amy Heil. So and Amy, am I saying your last name right? I, <laughs> I love, but I take it as it comes. Okay. <laughs> Isla. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> I should have asked you beforehand. <laughs> Um, and then also I want to thank Bill Davis and Carly Gomez in the provost office because they helped us get the TCI or the TeachX event off and running. Um, and of course, Erica offered all on TCI for um, supporting the TeachX event and Teaching Academy. So on October 21st, 22nd, 2022 was the first uh, TeachX event. Um, and it was in coordination with the TCI, with the Access Center, with the AOI, and also from additional financial support from the deans of 10, 10 WSU colleges and the chancellors of our urban campuses. Um, so it was definitely a um, collaborative event that took a lot of people and um, a lot of financial resources to get up and running. Um, and it was streamed to multiple campuses. The main event was held at WSU Pullman, uh, but it was streamed to all the other campuses. Um, the focus again was of uni universal design for learning. Um, and this uh, complemented the Teaching Academy Book Club as well. The main speaker was Kavita Rao from the University of Manoa. I'm not probably not saying that right. She was the keynote speaker, um, but she was followed by five other speakers, including Paul Kraus from the WSU Vancouver, Robin Williams from the Access Center, Michael Dunn from the w from WSU Vancouver, and Ali Asiri and Priya Pandey Shukla from which are WSU Pullman graduate students. Um, there were 216 registrants from across the WSU system and some outside of the WSU system, about a third of which um, our attendees attended online. And participants of the event received a packet of resources and materials that they could refer to at a later time to implement UDL in their classes. Um, and of course, that was put together by, or well, some of those resources were put together by um, graduate student Justine Trin. So she put a lot of work into that. Um, this event was complemented by the book club that provided over 111 copies of the book Reach Everyone, Teach Everyone, Universal Design for Learning and Higher Education. Um, the book was provided to faculty around the WC system, and the book club facilitators facilitated over eight different sessions and added a special session, which was a Q&A session with one of the authors of the book, um, Thomas Tobin, who actually, um, as a as it worked out, was um, one of our attendees at the TeachX event had tweeted out about the event and Thomas Tobin had responded and said he'd be willing to do a Q&A. So that was sort of a fortuitous, fortuitous uh, connection that was made at the TeachX event. So that was pretty cool. Um, we learned a lot from the first event and it was our second book club. Um, and we so we're probably going to be making some changes this year, sort of on the length, uh, maybe um, focusing in more on our speakers and and maybe thinking about some follow up workshops throughout at, for, for the actual event as well as um, throughout the the following um, semester and into spring. Um, we've also had some thoughts around adding in some um, faculty awards for those who um, participate in book club who um, implement some of the ideas um, and show you know impact. From, from those events. So that's another idea we've had. We're currently planning the next WSU TeachX event. Um, our tentative date is October 20th, 2023. Um, and we'll also have another fall 23 book club. And I think that the topic we're looking at is sort of 
small teaching, but moving beyond small teaching into um, topics of equity and, and inclusion in teaching. Um, we've narrowed it down to a few books, so we're, we're I'm getting close on that. Um, I also want to mention for anyone who's interested, the Academy is currently seeking new members. Um, applications are due by March 22nd. So if you're interested in that, please, you know, you can contact me, but there's also information on the WSU um, Teaching Academy website. All right, so with that, a lot of a lot of talking, I'm gonna turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Amy Hiley, or Hyla, um, she, who is an Academy member. Actually, she's been, I think she's been an Academy member longer than I have, um, and also a Student Services Coordinator Advisor in the Access Center, and she's going to discuss implementation of UDL in the classroom. So, thank you. So let me, again, figure out how to share my screen. Um, where are you? I think it's great that we've all forgotten how to do this. It means we've been in the classroom. Can you see it? See it? Okay. So I have my notes down here. So if I'm looking down, apologies. So um, Kara asked me to join her today to review what we learned at the TeachX event and also what we learned through the book club um, in the fall semester and kind of emphasize its continued relevance. So you will notice that there is some um, repetition to things that Don talked about. Um, during their presentation, but hearing them twice is not a bad thing. I think. So um, apologies for the repetition. But as Kara said, my name is Amy petersley Hyla, and I am an advisor in the Access Center on the Pullman campus. Um, our office here serves students in Pullman, but we also oversee global campus and extensions in Bremerton and Everett. Um, through my position as an advisor here in the Access Center, I support students with disabilities and chronic medical conditions by addressing barriers that may interfere with their academic success. So promoting universal design for learning is a part of that and something that I'm very passionate about. Um, when people think about the students who we support in the Access Center, they often think of students with visible or very um, apparent disabilities. So I thought it might be useful and relevant to the theme of today's kind of workshop of supporting students' well-being um, to point out that students with learning disabilities such as ADHD and those with conditions related to mental health, including um, depression and anxiety, make up a significant percentage of the students that the Access Center serves. Um, and those are just the students that apply for um, services through the Access Center, right? So we have many, 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 many students on our campuses who may face similar barriers, um, even if you as the teachers don't recognize it, or even if you haven't received that official notification letter from the Access Center requesting specific um, accommodations, right? So UDL can benefit all learners, not just students with disabilities. Um, and I think it's important to emphasize that. Prior to joining the Access Center in August 2022, I spent almost a decade as a member of the career track teaching faculty in the WSU English department. Um, that's when I became involved with the Teaching Academy. That's how I ended up being a facilitator of the book club. And I just wanted to mention my history um, to highlight the fact that I come to conversations about UDL with this dual perspective as somebody who works in equity and accessibility, but also someone who's put in the long nights and weekends and is intimately familiar with the stresses and frustrations um, of faculty and, and all of those things that lead to teacher burnout, which I think is also the theme um, for today. Um, so I was excited when Kara asked me if I would share more about UDL because I think it's something that supports students and teachers. Right? So let's get into it a little bit. Um, this will look familiar. Um, this is the same kind of framework that Don showed. So um, I'll try to keep my um, explanation of the UDL framework brief. But in general, it's an approach to course design that addresses the variability of learners and their needs. So the framework focuses on the why, the what, and the how of learning. And CAST, formerly known as the Center for Applied Special Technology, I believe is the acronym, um, is this nonprofit educational organization that came up with this framework. Um, and they provide these guidelines on how to address these aspects of learning. And as CAST claims, these guidelines offer a set of concrete suggestions that can be applied to any discipline or domain to ensure all learners can access and participate in meaningful, challenging learning opportunities, right? So the three guiding principles of the UDL framework are providing multiple means of engagement, 
multiple means of representation and multiple means of action and engagement. And when we provide multiple means of engagement, we address barriers related to students' interest and motivation, um, sustaining effort and persistence, and student self-regulation and recognition of their own progress. Ways to do this in the class is by providing students with choices and autonomy, highlighting the relevance and value of the course content, and encouraging students to be more active in their learning. When we provide multiple means of representation, we address barriers related to delivery and the way course content is presented to students. So the clarity of the information and in course content and barriers that may impede students' understanding. A ways to do this in the classroom is being mindful about the design of your course documents and providing materials in accessible formats, providing explanations for any specific terminology or colloquialisms or symbols or abbreviations that you may use. Um, and making connections between the course content and students' prior knowledge and experience. When we provide multiple means of action and expression, we address barriers related to the ways students are able to demonstrate their knowledge and their learning, um, the ways that they're able to communicate with you as a teacher and each other, and also their executive functioning, which has to do with how they organize their tasks and their time and prioritize effort. So some ways we can do this in our classes is by providing a variety of um, ways students are assessed and can demonstrate what they've learned, um, encouraging communication and making it easier for them to be able to communicate with you and to communicate with their classroom colleagues, um, and then also giving them um, scaffolding assignments and clearly defining the progression and processes of those assignments and projects, right? So there are a lot of considerations to make when creating a universally designed class. As Don said, it seems maybe simple on the surface, but it can be more complicated than that. Um, you anticipate the variability of the learners and then try to be accommodating from the beginning rather than only accommodating a select few students as need arises. Right? So you may be thinking, that sounds really great and I want to be accommodating to students and support their success but this does sound like a lot of extra time and work for me as a teacher. So here's my selling point. Um, implementing UDL can actually make teaching more efficient because it can eliminate the need for reteaching and retrofitting mid-semester when you're already busy, you're in the thick of things um, and you're stressed for time, right? So if you prevent it from happening, you don't have to address it mid-semester. Um, and also implementing it is not something that requires a complete overhaul of your course um, or an immediate overhaul of your course. The recommended approach to implementing UDL, especially if you're doing it on your own as a teacher and not as part of the departmental or university initiative, is to start by addressing or adjusting just one thing in your courses. And Don mentioned that as well. Um, in light of the theme for today's conference, we're talking about teacher burnout. I suggest starting with something that is gonna make your life as a teacher a little bit easier by identifying a pinch point. So pinch point is a term taken from engineering and machinery, and it refers to any point within a machine um, where a person could get pinched or injured or damaged in some way. And we use that term in this context when we're referring to a point in the semester that's a little bit painful, right? Or it doesn't go as smoothly as it can. Um, it might be a time when students seem to ask a lot of questions or a lot of students are asking the same question over and over, um, or it could be when students struggle to follow the instructions or they turn in something that doesn't resemble what you thought you were asking for and you're not sure how they got there, right? Um, I would imagine if given some time, you would be able to identify one or more pinch points in your semester. Some of you may already have identified them, you're thinking about them right now. For me, um, it was the first reverse outline assignment that I teach in my college composition courses. So reverse outlining is taking a text, breaking it down paragraph by paragraph and identifying the purpose and main point of each of the paragraphs and how they work together. So it's an incredibly useful skill um, for anybody who's conducting research or working on comprehension. So we talk about it early in the semester, um, so students are able to apply that skill in their other classes where they're doing reading and research, because I know that happens a lot. So I would start the lesson and introduce the concept by sharing an example of the end product. Then I'd outline the different steps and parts of that reverse outline. 
After that, I would share another focused example for us to examine together. And finally, we'd start reverse outlining the article that we were focusing on during that unit. So we would reverse outline the first paragraph as a whole class together. And then I would split the class into pairs and assign each pair another paragraph of the article so they can work together um, collaboratively to reverse outline it. At the end of class, they would share what they came up with. So we leave class with maybe 10 or 11 paragraphs of the article already um, reverse outlined, right? They have the rest of the week to complete the reverse outline individually. But students struggled with the assignment, even though I had planned out this careful lesson, right? Um, they struggled with the concept once they got home and um, were asked to finish outlining on their own. And they seemed to miss the concepts entirely. And they become very, very frustrated because the assignment felt really tedious because what they ended up with, their end product wasn't useful for them. And it took a lot of time to get there. So they were very frustrated. I was also very frustrated because I didn't understand why it wasn't working. Um, and I recognized that they were frustrated. Um, the first time this happened, I thought maybe I was just having a bad teaching day that day. Um, and so I didn't explain the concepts as well as I could have during class. But the following semester had the same frustrating results. And that takes us to step two, which is taking inventory of what you're already doing to see if you can figure out what you could add or adjust to remove barriers that might be impacting student success. So as I said, in my case, I provided multiple examples already. I provided opportunities for us to practice the skill together with my direct guidance. And then with partners to try it on their own and get confirmation before they left to finish the outlines individually. Um, I also posted the slides from class so that students could review them in their own time. And I really didn't know what else I could do. Um, so I asked my students and they appreciated me acknowledging their frustration and embraced the opportunity to kind of share their thoughts and feedback. And they reported that the demonstration in class was really useful and helpful in learning this skill, but it wasn't enough for them to feel confident um, performing this skill on their own a couple of days later when they sat down to finish the assignment. They also reported that the slides were really useful, but there were gaps in context and explanation on the static slides, right? That wasn't the same as the demonstration. And then one student said, yeah, it'd be really great if you recorded the demonstration and posted it so that we could review it when we're working on it ourselves, right? And this was before the pandemic and before I was um, as comfortable as I am now with incorporating technology. So recording a short video, demonstration video was something I had never thought of before, right? Um, so adding just that one short narrative video of the skill went a long way in helping all students better understand the concept and be able to apply it themselves. And that's the beauty of this class one approach to implementing UDL. So the class one approach, was a focus of the book that we read for the Teaching Academy's book club this past fall. Um, and Kara already gave a plug and explanation of the book club, so I'm just gonna skip over that part of it. But um, in the book, um, the authors Tobin and Bailing asked this question or these questions, right? Is there one more um, way that you can keep learners on task? Just one more way that you could give them information? Just one more way that you could demonstrate their skills? Um, and that's a good place to get started when you're thinking about how to implement um, UDL. So I'm recognizing that we're short on time. I did bring some examples. Do we wanna go through the examples or maybe save that for another presentation? I want just one example. I don't know about others. <laughs> just, just, I have to pick one. I well, no. the same the same um, condition as Don. I get very excited about it, and tearing things down is very difficult. Um, I, I I think it's okay to go through your examples. If folks need to peel off, we've got this recorded, and they come come back later. I'd hate to miss this opportunity to learn from you. <clears throat> Works for me. All right, because um, this is my favorite part of presentations is where you get something concrete that you can take back to your class and start thinking about and doing. So that's why I brought so many. All right, so the um, first thing you can do is provide both written and verbal instructions. So students process information in different ways. Some understand things easier when they can read the information. Some understand things easier when they can hear the information. So providing options and covering both bases can support overall success. And this could be when you're um, giving a project or an assignment, you have the written copy of the prompts. You also record an audio narrative. 
um, of you reading the prompts, but it also applies in class. So if you're doing an activity in class, post the instructions, the step-by-step -step instructions on a slide, on the board, give them written copy of the instructions rather than just relying on the verbal instructions that you give them. Um, and that way they have it to continue to reference as they're completing the activity. It's extremely helpful. Um, also utilize visual organizers to display information. A um, couple examples. This first one is from the syllabus. So it's explaining the grade distribution over the course of a semester. So the information is displayed in the number of points, in the percentage of the overall grade, and then also in the pie chart. So it's a quick, easy reference. Students can look at the pie chart and recognize, oh, exams and homework, those make up a big chunk of my semester grade, right? Um, and so it's easier for them to process the information quickly. Here's another example of a visual organizer. Um, this is just showing students the steps in the process of completing a project. It's showing them how those steps are integrated so they recognize the progress that they're going to be making and also the relevance of each of their steps and why each step is important because it builds into the next one. Um, including navigation guides on course materials can also um, significantly cut down on confusion and questions from students about where to find information and the resources that they need. So this example is from a syllabus. It's including a table of contents. Um, I recommend including a table of contents on any multi-page document, especially if it's a project prompt. So it's really easy for students to look at the table of contents if you know, they have questions about the requirements or they have questions about the assessment criteria or they have questions about how to submit their work, right? Um, including navigation guides on your course space and campus is also really helpful. I saw one in the UDL certificate space, which is awesome. Um, and that way they can't say, I didn't know where to find the reading or I didn't know where the Dropbox was. And that's why my assignment was late, right? We can cut down on some of that stuff. Um, provide opportunities to work um, independently and also work collaboratively because students have different strengths and can benefit from both. So the example is, say that you assign a case study in your class, um, students are gonna read the case study on their own, answer a set of questions um, on their own, and then submit the answers before class. Then during class, have students work on the same questions, but in small groups, and so that they can collaborate. Um, many people benefit from being able to think through their ideas or talk through their ideas and their understanding. Um, and so this gives them kind of um, an opportunity to do that. And it can also benefit the students who work better independently, where they have a checkpoint where they can see how their answers that they came up with compared to the answers that the group comes up with. And then after class, average the score for both of those activities. And that's the score that the student receives. It's a more equitable assessment um, that addresses kind of the needs of different types of learners. Um, also, provide students with multiple ways to interact with you and with each other. So this includes um, providing opportunities for them to talk with you over email. Some students have strengths in written communication over verbal communication. So having that as an option is really important. Um, in person, face to face might be beneficial. There are also students who can't come to your physical office hours for a variety of different reasons. One may be mobility reasons. Another may be scheduling. Right? They may have a really busy schedule and they're working um, on their assignments somewhere else. They're not able to get to your campus office. Having a Zoom option um, is preferable in that situation, right? So they can still talk through it in face-to-face -face and have a conversation with you, but they don't have to physically be on campus in your office. Um, utilizing the discussion board, if you don't do this already, I would recommend it, is having just a pinned forum, questions for discussion or questions for instructor discussion forum in Canvas. And this is just a general place where students can ask general questions about assignments or course content. And this is really great because it um, allows other students to benefit from the answer that the, the asking student is getting, right? Many students have the same questions. Here's an answer everybody can see. Of course, this wouldn't be a place where students want to post things about their individual grades or personal circumstances, but general course questions can go there. You can subscribe to the discussion board. Students can just uh, subscribe to the discussion board. And that way, none of you have to monitor it in Canvas. You'll get a notification if anybody posts. Um, and that can be really helpful, giving them another option to interact with you. And utilizing those discussion boards in Canvas is also really beneficial. 
um, as an assignment. So for similar reasons, right? Some students communicate better. They feel more confident communicating through written language rather than being on the spot talking to a bunch of people they may not be comfortable with in the classroom setting. So we can give them a variety of options of ways that they can demonstrate their learning. And then the final one, which was already talked about, um, Don mentioned it, and I think it came up in the chat. It might have. Um, the last example I wanted to provide relates to providing options when it comes to deliverables. And when I'm talking about deliverables, I'm talking about the actual thing that students submit, right? The thing, the end of the project that they turn in, that end product. And I brought this example. Um, so instead of being limited to just demonstrating their knowledge through like a five paragraph essay, right? You may provide them other options that will meet the same outcomes. Um, so maybe they'll create an infographic or a poster or a podcast. And a lot of the concerns that I've heard in conversations about UDL that came up in the book club quite often, um, teachers often express discomfort in providing these types of options for deliverables or end products because they're not used to assessing them, right? They've been assessing um, academic essays for a billion years now. They've read thousands of them at this point. And so they have that down, um, you know, as kind of second nature. They understand that creature a little bit better than say like a podcast that they've never assessed or evaluated before, right? Um, to address those concerns, I would say, remember that the assessment of the project should be based on um, what you're teaching in the course, right? And so, this example, the requirements are listed here. The assessment criteria is develops and supports a clear argument that incorporates evidence from the textbook and at least two scholarly journal articles. They can do that in writing. They can also do that in a podcast. They can also demonstrate that skill or meet that assessment criteria in an infographic, right? So there are multiple means of getting to the same goal. Um, in UDL, we say firm goals, flexible means, right? And as I wrap up, um, I just wanted to point out as we're talking about assessment and accessibility, TCI's next fifth stop in March, um, I believe is an assessment that promotes inclusion. So I recommend participating in that um, to get more ideas maybe about equitable assessments. Um, and with that flag, I will, I will wrap it up here. Those examples were fantastic. <laughs> Do we have any questions for Kara or Amy? Or any any of our presenters? We've got them still on. You know, I just want to say I thought that was that was really great. And you know, you I think uh my favorite thing in there and i just sent you an email that you'll hopefully respond to um but you know one of the areas of universal design for learning that i think i haven't really thought about as much but probably should is just the udl application to your syllabus i think i focus a lot in my own head about innovative like standing in front of people or delivery of content but just, and and then, you know, have the Captain Picard facepalm meme constantly in my head of, no, seriously, that information is in the syllabus of, you know, what's happening day to day in class. Um, and so I, I thought that were, you gave some really good examples um, uh, in there. So, great. Yeah, thanks. The syllabus is actually where I started because I have background in graphic design. And so I was like, let's make this document more accessible and then translate it beyond that. So that was kind of my first plus one of UDL implementation. That's a really good one. <laughs> All right. If we have no further questions or comments, um, this ends our morning session for Elevate, so go enjoy some of your catch-up time, um, <laughs> and I hope you'll join us again this afternoon at 1 p.m. I put the information for the session, it'll be the same Zoom link, so all you have to do is, is click again. See you soon. Thank you to all our speakers. <laughs>